the title that we picked for today is Auto Ethnographic Perspectives on the College Workforce Transition. And then there's another piece for anthropology majors. And it's interesting to think about also as we go through it, how applicable this is beyond anthropology majors, what lessons we might draw outside of this one discipline that happens to be, you know, the students happen to be well prepared to do this kind of research, but some of their findings might apply more broadly. So we can talk about that too. So to begin with, I want to talk a little bit about what this project is, what we did and the origins of it. Um, then I'll talk about a couple of, I've called them findings in my slides. Findings is kind of a, a stretch. They're more like sort of ideas that I'm playing with these days. Um, and then the, at the end, I want to talk a little bit about process um, and how our work has been going. So. Um, as Matt said, my title is Manager of Education, Research, and Professional Development at the American Anthropological Association. Um, and this being sort of within, housed within the research piece of that, um, this, is, this is sort of a diverse portfolio that includes public outreach projects, it includes professional development and mentoring and leadership development for members of our association. Um, but sort of day to day, I spend a lot of time doing research. And when you do research in an association, and when you wanna deal with questions like, uh, what are the prospects for undergraduates majoring in our discipline, the research tends to look a little bit like this. Um, we can look at bachelor's degree completions in anthropology versus in all fields, the numbers that are reported in iPads. And so you can see from 1987 until around the year 2000, anthropology is growing much faster. More people are graduating in anthropology um, relative to all fields. Um, until around uh, 2009 or so, they keep pace. There's a lot of little increase from 2009 until around 2013. So things are looking really good for anthropology in 2013. And then all of a sudden, something happened. And this is what I could tell from the data sources that I had available to me sitting in my office in an office building in Arlington, Virginia. And for me, with a background in linguistic anthropology, this is provocative but really unsatisfying. This tends to be the way that association researchers work because it's the data that you have available, right? It's like the, the story of uh, looking for your lost keys under the street light, right? When you actually lost them down that dark alley, but you can't see in the dark alley, so you look under the street light. Um, I guess I'm feeling like there's something going on here with, if you look at the numbers, 2013 is when you would be graduating from a four-year degree if you were applying to schools during the uh, 2008 financial crisis. And so there's something suggestive there that maybe, and you know, there's a lot in popular media and just general perceptions of anthropology that people think it's not career ready, which is something that we struggle with on a daily basis, this perception. And so maybe that's what's playing into this. But we really want to dig into it and find out more. I can do these methods, but I'm much more comfortable with these methods, right? So this is, this is a little transcript from an unrelated project that I did where I was interviewing PhD students who are interested in doing other things than being professors people who are working on their PhD in anthropology and have other things in mind. Um, and this transcript, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with it, but this was really interesting because um, she says in the beginning, we haven't done anything that's focused on applied careers, but then she says, uh, I'm, I'm in charge of running a colloquium series. We brought some, we, we, somebody suggested that we could bring some people back to talk about different kinds of careers they've had, but then we realized nobody would come, so we didn't do it. Nobody would come, we don't do this kind of thing. This particular person, together with her PhD in anthropology, is also working on a master's degree in multivariate statistical methods because she wants to work for a government uh, policy analysis or, or shop or think tank. And so she's focused on those things, but nobody would come. And so we're trying to think about, again, even at the, at the doctorate level, there's this real difficulty in thinking about careers for anthropologists. And these are the kind of methods that I like and these are the kind of methods that I sort of do because I can. So we're thinking about for this undergraduate question, how can we get out there and sort of be in classrooms and talking to people? Um, and if I think about training that I've had really in ethnographic methods, I'm not gonna go and like sit in an undergraduate, you know, in the, in the student gathering area and chat with people about what are you thinking about for jobs because I look like a professor and they're not gonna really open up to me. And so uh, the idea sort of percolated up through me discussing it with some colleagues that really the way to do it would be to get undergraduate students to do the field work, right? Um, thinking about what we can do as an association, my boss uh, likes to say there are really three things that we can do. Um, we can bring people together, we can amplify voices, and we can be the gatekeepers of good scholarship and professional standards. And really, for us to do this work in that way, by working together with undergraduates, it sort of plays on all of those different superpowers that we have as an association. We can't do the research ourselves but we can bring people together who will do the work 
we can amplify their work once they've completed it. And we can you know, sort of act as quality control and help them through it. And so really, thinking back to what my job is, it really sort of bridges between research side and the professional development side. Because we have this cohort of students that's working with us, and they get the chance to have these field experiences. Um, as part of their application package, they needed a letter of support from a AAA member. We didn't specify who. In all cases, it turned out to be, unsurprisingly, a professor at their institution where they're currently enrolled. Um, because the way that the mentoring works for them as research fellows is very distributed. I'm not able to be there, you know, I'm a sort of PI on the grant, but I'm not able to be there with all of these people doing their research day to day. And so we wanted to set up a system where, first of all, somebody would vouch for them and say, yes, you know, I know this person is a sophomore but is promising and can do this kind of work and, and I will support them. Um, and then to also actually count on that person to support them. Um, so we uh, set out a call and we recruited, this is the announcement that we originally made last December that we had selected, this says six inaugural, inaugural. Um, I do still get calls asking if we're gonna do it again next year. Um, yeah, uh, undergraduate research fellows uh, funded by CCWT. It says six, they're, they're at five field sites. One of the field sites had two people at the time. It's actually expanded now. Um, and I can talk a little bit about what that is. Um, but they're, they're supporting research projects that use ethnographic or mixed methods to address the question, how do anthropology majors prepare for life after college? So they all had to submit research proposals um, related to that question. Uh, and we, we gave each research team at each institution um, funding for fellows and mentors to attend our annual meeting, um, which is uh, about six weeks from now in Vancouver. If you're free, you should come join us. Um, as well as uh, research funding for whatever expenses they might have, which generally it's been spent on uh, incentives for participants, transcription services, and uh, supplementing the conference travel. Because even, even though we're giving them a stipend, it can still be prohibitive for a lot of people. Um, so who do we recruit? Um, there are five institutions represented. And so I guess I can go from closest to me to further out. This is St. Mary's College of Maryland, which is a um, four-year liberal arts public college um, in Southern Maryland. That's the uh, University of Louisville, uh, Indiana University in Bloomington, Illinois State, and uh, Wheaton College, which is an uh, evangelical Christian institution uh, just outside of Chicago. Um, and so now we have, uh, we initially had uh, a team of two applicants from St. Mary's College and one from each of the others. But various things have happened and now we have three people at St. Mary's College, three people at Louisville, two at Illinois State, um, just because for, for various reasons they felt the need to bring on more people to support the work. Um, and so it's been really great to see how once we've started this kind of undergraduate research opportunity, it's been expanded so more and more students can participate in it. Um, we have conference calls with them, uh, with whoever can make it. So it's a rotating cast of characters every two weeks. And uh, most of the fellows come, mentors come and go as they're available. Um, we check in and hear from them about what they're working on and we share sort of upcoming project goals and deadlines and talk about also issues of method and issues of theory that come up um, as we're working on the project. And it's really, you know, I'll, I'll share a little bit later on about what we talk about on the calls, but we try to stay connected as much as we can over such a distributed area. This doesn't even give an indication of how distributed it is because our fellow from Indiana University last semester when we were in fieldwork phase was actually on junior year abroad at University of Canterbury in, in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand. And so she's doing a, a comparative study. She has data from New Zealand. She's now collecting data in Bloomington and she's gonna be contrasting and comparing what kind of thing she hears from people at these different places. It's a diversity of types of institution. So um, I mentioned uh, you know, the ones that we had, uh, University of Canterbury is, I think she said it's mainly an engineering school. And so students who are studying social science there, it tends to be very interdisciplinary um, just because that's who's available and that's the courses that you can get. Um, but then she was sharing findings about that and it sparked off a whole lot of conversation about interdisciplinarity as it looks at all of these other different schools and different field sites. Um, so that was really exciting as well. Um, there's a lot that comes out of this collaboration and I'm really excited to be able to support it. Um, the research questions that they proposed in their initial proposals were things like, how do anthropology students talk about their future selves? Which is one that I loved as a linguist. Um, what do alumni say is the value of their anthropology major? Uh, at a Christian institution, how do students talk about vocation? The idea that you have a calling rather than just a job. Um, 
is cross-cultural competence viewed as a professional skill? Um, and so this was what they proposed. The way these things go, it sort of goes off in different directions. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about, about how that's been. Um, and they use a sort of standard slate of methods. Um, there's one group did a survey of alumni, um, which was really nice because through this project, we helped to establish closer connections between the anthropology department and the alumni office, which sometimes is difficult for the department to track where, where alumni go. But um, anybody who's ever got a fundraising letter in the mail knows that the alumni office knows where you are. Um, there's been a lot of focus groups, uh, as well as some follow-up interviews. There was at least one person who did participant observation in the career center. Um, and so it's, uh, it's been a good mix of, of data sources coming in and a lot of, a lot of material for us to talk about. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what they're finding. Um, and I said, as I said before, these are sort of more ideas that I'm playing with right now based on having read some of their work. A lot of this is based on um, the work of Emily Ding, who's our fellow at Wheaton College, just because um, she happened to write hers up as a term paper for her eth ethnographic methods class last semester. Um, and so I got to read it. And so it's, it's a little bit more polished than what the other fellows have done up till now. Um, but six weeks from now, we'll have a round table in Vancouver. And so all of you who are free to come to our annual meeting are welcome to, uh, to join us and hear from them personally. Um, the first sort of idea that I'm playing with is the idea of your experience as an undergraduate student as a chronotope. Um, if this isn't a familiar term, it comes from Mikhail Bakhtin, who's a Russian literary theorist. Um, it's the idea that as you are telling a story, in his case through a novel, um, time and space are parsed out into units. It's not something that's sort of discreetly measurable, but it's a choice that you make in how you tell the story. And that they're discreetly bounded in certain ways. There's a, there's a time and space sort of complex um, that has certain qualities that makes it distinct from another. Um, so this is coming out of literary theory, but it's been really useful for people in linguistic anthropology um, and narrative analysis, thinking about, you know, even if I'm not writing a literary narrative, as I tell my own life story, there's still a sense of these chronotopes. And so I'm seeing some evidence in the way that undergrads talk about their experience in school as having that kind of a quality to it, that it's a bounded thing that's hard to see out from. Um, and so we'll see things like, um, when I majored in anthropology, I chose anthropology class because it kind of felt like a community. This is um, quotes from participants. Um, and this particular participant was contrasting it with, uh, I think, a health sciences. She had changed her major from health sciences. And she said, in health sciences, they're more hardworking and disciplined and driven. This was how she talked about it. Um, and then as she talked further, it became clear that what she meant by that is they're more focused on specific career goals. It's not that anthropology students aren't dedicated to anthropology, um, but that the appeal of anthropology is not so much in terms of that future self of doing this job that I know that it, what it is and I know I want to do it, but it's more in terms of I become a member of this community of practice um, where I have close relationships and I feel mutually supported. Um, there was another, another participant who they went to a sort of a formal dinner where you would sit with people from your department. And this is in a joint anthropology sociology department. And she, there wasn't enough space at the anthropology table. And so she ended up sitting with the sociologists. And she said, it was just kind of a bummer because I was expecting to come and sit with my major and all my friends were at the next table. And so this real tight relationships within that group. Um, but then sort of reflecting on this, and this is where this idea of chronotype is really coming up for me. Um, she says, we're in college. And then it's hard to remember that there's also a life before and after college too. Um, this is a theme that comes up again and again in, in this particular paper in Emily's work that undergraduates or her anthropology majors that she's working with, they really are focused on um, what they're doing now in their coursework. Um, they're doing it because they're interested in it, not because they see a utility in it. It's not that there is no utility in it, it's that that question doesn't come up for them. And whether they would have majored in something else if it did is, is kind of a, it's hard to talk about counterfactuals and hypotheticals in that way. Um, but I think what I am really noticing is, is what is the effect of that? Given that we do have this group of anthropology students, they are thinking of it in this way, what happens because of that? And so what, what Emily talks about, because this is uh, really an evangelical school, she talks about it in terms of the idea of calling versus formation, um, where it's not my background. I'm sort of taking this out of, out of her writing. Um, so I apologize for any, any mistakes I might make in, in, in terms of the theology of it. Um, but my understanding is that a calling is the idea that God has a purpose for you. 
compared to formation is the idea of how you become a more godly individual. And she says that she expected um, the students in her department to be talking more about their calling or their vocation. And instead, they talk about it more as formation. By me studying anthropology, I become a better person in specific ways that they can talk about. Um, when she talked to administrators, they were more interested in the idea of calling. But the students were saying, you know, when I came in, she said, I expected them to talk about it. They weren't talking about it. Maybe it's because I'm asking the wrong questions. And so she said, could you reflect on this idea of calling for me? And they said, well, yeah, I guess I um, naively had the idea that there was a specific plan that I just had to figure out, like God already knew what I was supposed to do, and I had to figure out what that was. And now I've come to think of it in a no more nuanced way, that whatever I end up doing is, is going to be of some use. Um, and the, the, the changing ways of thinking about, about these topics as they become you know, members of this anthropology community of practice. She also said they would then sort of make this rhetorical pivot and start analyzing those things as anthropologists. Um, if, you've ever, if you've ever interviewed researchers, it's great. Um, I once concluded an interview by saying, um, is there anything we didn't talk about that, that you wanted to say? And my participant said, you know, I always ask my interviewees that question too. <laughs> so it's kind of that moment where it's like they, they, they're taking it, uh, they're, they're understanding what they're doing, they're talking about it as anthropologists. So it gets back to that other research question about how do, they, how do they talk about their future selves, how do they talk about their current selves, how do they talk in more anthropological ways, how does that show them sort of becoming anthropologists, what does that look like? Um, and specifically in this where she talks about there being a tension between anthropological ideas of cultural relativism and the, the way that a lot of, you know, if, if students are majoring in theology and planning on a career in ministry, um, that's a much more common thing at evangelical institutions. There's not many that have anthropology programs at all. Um, and so she definitely feels a tension there, and she's really more supported by this community of practice, which leads to this sort of um, self-contained way of thinking about it as a, as a chronotope is the, the term that I'm thinking of. And I think really this uh, structure, this configuration, I don't know what the word for it is, this thing th that I'm thinking about has some real implications for advising, which is something that she writes about as well. She says, um, students are reluctant to go to the Career Services Center, um, partly because it's inconveniently located, but partly because you have to fill out a form. And one of the questions on the form is, what do you want to talk about? And I don't even know, so I feel like I'm not ready for this. And partly because when I go there, I see everybody's dressed in business attire. And so that sends a message, along with when you have all the posters up about, we have an event next week about how can you get a career in consulting and finance. And then I show up there, and everybody's wearing a suit. And this is not for me, right? Um, that's a different chronotope um, compared to where I am with my anthropology community. And Emily, the research fellow, mentioned this to the career services people. And she says they got super defensive about it. Of course, we're professionals. We dress like this. Um, so I think there are, I don't know exactly where it goes, but I think to the extent that this holds elsewhere, it's something to be considered if you're thinking about how can we be better advisors to our undergraduate students and help them think about what is beyond that boundary because they don't want to, it's not going to end well for anyone if they sort of fall out and prepared for, for what's next um, and are left to fend for themselves. So um, the second thing I wanted to talk about is this concept of career orientedness. Um, which you see uh, coming out in a lot of the, the research literature about college to career transitions, that some fields of study are more career oriented than others. Um, and I want to use an a anthropological uh, theoretical framework of an ideology of differentiation to talk about it, which I'll define in more detail as I get to it. But um, it's uh, based on work in language ideologies, and I think it applies here as well. So where this is coming from is from Students saying things like, I guess as an anthropology major, it's not completely obvious what kind of job you're going to go in. Whereas with business, it's pretty much guaranteed you're going to land a businessy type job. I love that, a businessy type job, because that's also super vague. And I don't know whether she's doing that to signal that it's unfamiliar to her, or whether it means that businessy type jobs are just as vague as anthropology type jobs. But that's really counterintuitive, because we have this belief that they're not. Right? We have a belief that a bachelor's in business administration, you'll like leave and immediately know what you want to do with it, which I don't know whether that's the case. I haven't worked with undergrad business students. Um, although my, my cousin just finished her uh, 
bachelor's in business, and she did land a job like within a month, so there's that. Um, but, um, but this is really sort of pinging off this idea for me of, of academic versus career-oriented majors. This study, um, this, this was a large-scale study, uh, Choi and Bradburn, of um, students across different types of majors and, and what they, how they end up sort of navigating that transition, what kind of support they have. And they make this broad distinction between academic and career-oriented majors where all of the social sciences and humanities count as academic. And career-oriented would be things like um, undergraduate degrees in education or nursing or uh, business. Um, but also, in other work that I was doing, that other study that I showed you, the, the line graph with the data from, from the um, Department of Education, I was wondering whether the same thing holds at the level of, like, between one social science field and another. Um, there's reason to believe that, or in this study, they talk about how academic majors tend to be more elite. Um, so uh, if you study something like anthropology, it's not just that it doesn't sound like a job, but it's also that maybe students at uh, more elite institutions are more likely to study anthropology, where students either, you know, first generation college students, lower socioeconomic status, feel more of a pressure to do something that is transparently job related. So this is a thing that people talk about, and I was curious about among social science fields whether it holds out. And so you can kind of make a two by two, where you can think of fields that are more or less elite, and fields that are more or less like jobish sounding, where anthropology is in the one quadrant where it's, it's more elite and sounds less like a job. And you can really contrast it with something like criminology, right? Where it tends to be more um, students from less selective institutions that study criminology. Um, and it also sounds like this is, it could be pre-law or it could be if I wanna be in law enforcement or like there's certain jobs that you think about. But you can fill out the rest of the two by two, right? You could think of something like economics, which economics is, um, how you do a bachelor's in business administration at a school that is too fancy to have undergraduate business degrees. Um, and yeah, <laughs> right. And speaking of my own experience, I, had a, I went to Brandeis for undergrad and everybody who was an econ major was because they wanted to go into business. That's the same. Yeah. To Lawrence, they didn't have a business degree, they had economics or innovation and entrepreneurship. Yeah, 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 there you go. Um, and then the other, the final square of the two by two could be something like general social science degrees. So can, you talk, can you say, is the term of, um, is it about, is it, does it have something to do with, uh, I think you were suggesting it has something to do with like some students have like the, the resources, background to have a more, less job tied uh -huh. academic pursuit. Uh -huh. Does it also have to do, when I think of anthropology, I think of like anthropological theory first. You know, and it's, it's not necessarily class position, although maybe you could make that argument, but it's like, uh, it's generalizing, it's comparative, it's mm. also tied to the social theorists like Marx or Freud who are con con controversial. And, uh, I don't know what you mean by elite exactly. There may be a couple things that you mean by elite. Yeah, it's tricky because there is not a good like metric for eliteness. Yeah. Um, although I've made several different attempts to, to come up with one. But <laughs> um, in this case, what I could do is I could say, as a proxy for eliteness, I can say, um, you can look at how many degrees are granted year over year in these fields, and you can look at how selective the universities are that are granting these degrees. Um, based on the um, people at Indiana University that publish the Carnegie classifications also publish um, which quintile the schools fall into as far as ACT and SAT scores of accepted, you know, newly matriculating undergraduates. And so that's kind of the proxy that I'm using for measuring eliteness here. Um, I think you're right that there is something sort of conceptual and it's hard to tease out like how much is this or that. And it's, it's like, I don't know what I would take as good evidence tying the one to the other. Um, but I feel like that might be the difference between economics and business, you know, um, or, maybe between anthropology or sociology and social work. Um, and so some, some of those real fine grained distinctions, you might, you might see um, those sorts of differences in curriculum decisions. And that would be interesting to pursue further, but I don't really have any evidence that speaks to that one way or another. I kind of had to use this very coarse way of measuring it. And again, it's, that's at the institutional level. So I have to presume that whatever is true of, of this college or university overall reflects on their criminology department in a way that matters for what I'm doing. And so that's an assumption that I just kind of had to make. Is there another question? I'm sorry. Um, no, I was just thinking about eliteness and the way you explained it, it sounds like exclusiveness or how difficult is it to get into a field? 
Yeah, selectivity is the word that the Carnegie people use. Yeah. One could also just look at the filtering on the statuses that people Right. You, you could if you had data on it. Okay. Um, and uh, I guess you could collect data on it, but it's tricky to think of where you'd get it from. Um, this was something I could do in a sort of quick and dirty fashion. And so I'll share it for what it's worth. Um, if you chart them out, um, in this, what this means is the um, green line is schools in the top quintile, students graduating from schools in the top quintile at SAT, ACT schools scores. The red line is the next two quintiles. And the blue is either schools that are the lowest two quintiles or that don't care about standardized exam scores and admissions. Um, and so the terminology I use for that is more selective, selective, and inclusive. And this is what it looks like for anthropology. And you can see what the trends are looking like in terms of you know, falling after the financial crash, and also in terms of anthropology being more weighted towards those more elite schools. Um, and then if you compare it with criminology, um, it looks like the, the students at the sort of um, less um, selective schools are continuing to study criminology in spite of the, in spite of the financial crash when uh, it's sort of flat all along in the elite schools. And so it's more, more weighted towards the, uh, the less selective schools. But then if you fill out the other two, OK, so economics looks much like anthropology up until 2012 or 13, and then it just keeps going up. And then if you compare it to general social science, and this one is mainly, uh, it's, it's interesting because sort of up until, I think that's around the year 2000, it's an even mix across, across these selectivity classifiers. And then it goes way up, and then it comes way back down again after the crash. Um, and so there's, I guess what I'm, what I'm seeing here, my takeaway from this, is that the social science fields that saw a downturn after the crash are not the elite ones or the non-elite ones. They're the ones that don't sound like jobs, regardless of how selective or how elite sounding they are. And so this is suggesting you can sort of decouple the idea of something being career oriented um, from something being uh, elite or, or prestigious, right? Um, where regardless of the sort of class ideas of it, this idea that, I mean, this is, this is, I can't really conclude this, but it sort of feels like it's trending this way. The idea that in a down economy, you need to have an undergraduate degree that points you toward a career, regardless of your own socioeconomic background, that everyone's feeling those pressures. So this is kind of where I feel this trending. And I don't feel comfortable saying that this shows that, but it sort of hints that way. Um, and so just thinking of this together with the other discussion of um, you know, comparing all social sciences look like this compared to uh, you know, business and nursing and education look like that. Um, but then, uh, this is from a different one of the research groups at St. Mary's College. It happens to be on an archaeological field site um, of, I think it's uh, early European colonization. Um, and there's a lot of work around historic St. Mary's City that students in the anthropology department are actively involved in. And so their findings show that students who are more socioculturally oriented in that department have a really different experience to students who are more archaeologically oriented. And so this, this is uh, the student there who's writing about this says, many of the students are studying archaeology as a focus. These students tended to have a much clearer path forward to their ideal career. And so in the university, there are more and less career-oriented fields. Among the social sciences, there are more and less career-oriented fields. Among the subfields of anthropology, there are more and less career-oriented fields, right? Um, and I feel like a related notion to this is the idea of skills. This isn't uh, data. This is something that one of the fellows said on the conference call. I feel like I love what I do, but I have no skills. Um, and I don't think she was, I'm not sure if she was really speaking for herself or if she was like voicing a trend that she's heard from her participants. Um, but that I have no skills. What, what, what's behind that? And so I think in this idea of job preparation, career orientedness, there's this idea of skills. There's a lot of talk about hard skills and soft skills. Um, and so I think you can talk about the you know, academic versus career oriented, soft skills versus hard skills, humanities versus STEM. And that's something that I'm glad to deconstruct all day, but I'll spare you. Um, anthropology versus economics, you know, within the social sciences. Ethnography versus archaeology, within the subfields of anthropology. Every time you zoom down, there's that distinction. And so this is where I want to talk about this idea of 
ideologies of uh, differentiation. And so this comes from work by uh, Judy Irvin and Susan Gall, uh, linguistic anthropologists, talking about how you have, you know, how you, there's the question of what's, what's a different language, which is kind of a, really more of a political question than a scientific question. If we feel like we're a group of people and you're a different group of people, then we have a different language to you. Um, so the, they, they talk about the processes through which this takes place. It's iconization, which means the way that these people talk comes to be associated with, like, that's just the kind of people that they are, and the one stands in for the other. Um, the second piece, fractal recursivity, is that what we're seeing the same is with this distinction between um, academic and career orientedness. At any level of magnification, there's a similar kind of a split, right? Um, you can talk about how people, um, you know, for me coming from the East Coast, and I sort of have this idea of what the upper Midwest is. But then I get here and I see, oh, there's, there's you know, Wisconsin and Minnesota. I'm like, never mind, right? And so whatever, whatever level you zoom into, there's a, there's a, a distinction there. Um, and then the third piece, erasure. So anything that doesn't fit into this paradigm becomes invisible. And I think the same thing, if you, if you, if you want to talk about what gets erased in things like this, it's the idea that um, salaries and professional outcomes for people who study plant biology in their undergraduate and people who study English are very similar in terms of the kind of salaries they get, in terms of the kind of employment rates they have, um, which sort of everything that we, all the commonplace notions that we have about STEM versus the humanities just go out the window. But there's no way to see that in this sort of ideology of differentiation in the way that we, we think of there are some things that are career oriented and some things that are academic. Um, I think where I would want to go with this is to think about other ways of talking about it that help us to understand the complexity of it. And so rather than talking about hard skills and soft skills, and this again, this goes back to um, Emily's work, she says, I prefer to think about tools for understanding and tools for problem solving. And so uh, I put in my notes here a couple of more detail of what she said. She said, tools for understanding comprised interpersonal skills, reading and synthesizing information, critical thinking skills, and possessing vocabulary to describe certain situations that were part of the human experience. Tools for problem solving included identifying patterns, applying framework for tackling social, different social situations, and as one of my participants pointed out, quote, discovering what's not there, discovering the unknown, which she cited as an intersection between her current study of anthropology and her future pursuit of medical practice. So whatever you study, you can have some tools for understanding and some tools for problem solving. And that kind of gets you past this, like some people are like this and some people are like that way of thinking. Um, so just an idea of, of a way forward. Um, so I want to say a couple of things now about the, the kind of experience that we've had working on this project. Um, because that's really been, for me personally, the most exciting thing has been getting the chance to work with the research fellows and have them go out and sort of do all of this research work. And really, I'm privileged to be here and present to you work that someone else did. Um, but uh, I, want to, I want to talk a little bit more about that. One idea that's come up a lot is the idea of native ethnography. Um, so somebody cited uh, Zora Neale Hurston. We talked on the conference call once about um, Linda Tuhiwai Smith. There are all of these different theorists who talk about um, breaking down the distinction between who is a researcher and who is a subject. Um, and I don't want to stretch, I feel like this is a metaphor that I don't want to stretch farther than it goes. Um, I don't think that students are literally colonized by institutions of higher education, although some people might try to make that case. Um, but I think that there are interesting sort of consonances or resonances that you can think about in terms of what does it mean to begin as a member of this community and then learn a certain uh, disciplinary perspective on how you can learn about communities sort of in general and how they work. And take that tool set and turn it back on the community that you originated from. And so that could be in the sense of you know, indigenous researchers. It could be in the sense of students doing research on students. Um, I remember feeling this way during my own uh, grad school experience as a former teacher doing classroom-based research. Um, and I think that there's, there's, it kind of points a way forward as anthropology, you know, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, trying to um, deal with the legacy of having been complicit in colonialism, you know, 150 years ago. 
but people now really feeling a responsibility based on that to, to do better. Um, and I think one way to think of that is whatever community you might be working with, um, how do the members of that community become more involved in the research project and the research process? Um, it's one of the sort of core ideas of applied anthropology is that whatever you're doing has to benefit the members of the community that have invited you in to work with them. But maybe if the you is also the them, it looks a little bit different. Um, and that's something that we've, we've been able to talk about. Um, this was another thing that, that came up. This is me paraphrasing, um, but something that we talked about on the conference call. Um, one of the research fellows said, all of my interview participants are my friends. Maybe that's why they're willing to say such personal things. So given that somebody else would not have heard the same things from them, what does that mean about my findings? Are they even valid? If some other researcher would have come in and asked you know, the same questions and got different answers. Um, is this ethical for me to be using this relationship that I have to get these kind of things from people? And then what do I do with it when I have it? Is it still OK if I go out and present it at a conference? And I was so excited when she asked that question. Because these are the real concerns that happen when you, you know, you can, you can do homework assignments and read, you know, primary sources all day long. And you can read about these questions, but these were real to her. These, like, the, the, she was really feeling this idea of, you know, how are my relationships sort of enmeshed with my research process? Um, how do I act responsibly? as a participant in these relationships and also as a researcher at the same time, is there a conflict there? And that was a really exciting conversation to have. And I can tell you what I said to her, but that's sort of beside the point. Um, I was just really excited that we got to have that conversation. And I think um, the, as I was doing before trying to think about ways forward, implications of this work, um, similarly an implication of this is that getting students involved in this kind of research experience is a way to help them see what they're doing that is so useful. You know, that they can, they can deal with this stuff. The reason that this matters is that they're learning something new that nobody knows. And that's, you know, something that if we're gonna be, I'm sorry, neoliberal about it, that employers would be interested in. Um, and then I guess the other, just in terms of nuts and bolts, and I love this so much that I just had to conclude on it, um, how do you know when you're done? Um, I've, I've done this many interviews. I have this working analysis of it. Do I need more interviews? Should I be writing up or should I be pushing the analysis further? And like obviously this is a case by case question, but that's something that, you know, that discussion is never ending. Um, and it's great to have a real topic to talk about. So this is not abstract, right? This is, what do I do when we get off the phone? I have these couple of different tasks that I could do. Which one should I pick? Um, and uh, I guess um, that's as good a moment as any for me to say that I'm done. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you to, again, to the, to the center for supporting this work, um, to Pamela Jackson as the research coordinator who works with me at AAA and has done all of the sort of uh, groundwork of, of making all the, all the gears turn. Um, all the research fellows, especially Emily Ding, whose work I lean on heavily in this presentation, um, and Gigi Jones at National Center for Education Statistics, who helped me out with the, with the iPad stuff. Here's my contact information. One thing that was brought up was um, how disciplines like psychology have really infiltrated secondary schools through like AP tests and something, and how that was possible Misconceptions that people may have. Yeah. Psychology also has another benefit, which is that psychologist is a job that people know. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's hard to say, in the case of psychology, the, the relative weight of those two things. I think history is another useful comparison because historian is not a job that people know, but everyone studies it in high school. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anthropology, being really a discovery major um, in that way, there is. Um, more work that has to be done to even have students know it's a thing and even take one class in it. And then once you do, they're hooked and you can sort of go from there. Um, 
There are people who teach anthropology in high schools. It's unusual. Usually it's either in a dual credit setting um, where they're working together with a local community college or a satellite uh, state university campus and students are getting college credit for it or else through the International Baccalaureate where there is an IB course in social cultural anthropology specifically. Um, and then aside from that, there are a couple of, occasionally you'll see like a, a one semester four fields anthropology elective that would come from something like, I know of one case where there were people from the um, Smithsonian who had done workshops for teachers on how you could offer anthropology. And in a couple of places, um, one in Northern Virginia and one I think in Wyoming, um, there were teachers who managed to go back and implement it and have courses. Um, and we're trying to think about ways of supporting that work. Um, AP is a very high stakes bet. Sociology put together a proposal, and they do have better sort of K-12 representation than we have. They put together a proposal for uh, an AP test in sociology, and they brought it to the College Board. And College Board does have a sociology exam in a different suite of exams that's more for like um, course equivalencies, um, that if you've, if you've studied sociology somewhere and you want to get credit for it, you can take this course. Um, I forget, the CLEP, I think, is the name of it. I don't remember what that stands for. Um, but they put together also this proposal for an AP test, and the College Board didn't like it, and now they never want to hear from them again. And it is a huge, like, seven-figure investment to even get the proposal together. Um, so we've thought about different ways of approaching this, either by um, trying to amplify voices of people who are doing it already, by working with the National Council on Social Studies, because there is like a five-page appendix on the end of their standards that sort of introduces the notion that anthropology is a thing that you could do in principle. Um, and if that's sort of a, a launch pad that we could depart from. Um, if there was a way that we could partner with geography, if there's gonna be ever modifications to the AP Human Geography test, which is like this close to being anthropology already. Um, and so we the sort of, looking for opportunities in all of these different ways, but it is a struggle. Yeah. Um, and I don't know whether, no, I have data, but I don't remember offhand, um, whether some of these other fields, you know, history, psychology, sociology, like what kind of impact they saw after the, uh, the financial crash, if that's our indicator. Yeah. Um, I can bring those charts up if you want to see them, but. Uh, yeah. um, I was wondering, uh, when you interviewed the students at these different schools. Um, like I know, for instance, in my college, with my friends who studied anthropology, relied more on their professors to find opportunities after college versus career services because they didn't have the resources for that major. So, was that a trend that you saw? Depend like how like, does it vary depending on which institution you go to, where students utilize career services more than the department itself, or? I feel like what I'm hearing, and it's the extent that I'm hearing anything, is that people don't really do either. Okay. Um, which was also my experience. I was a comparative lit major. So talk about what's career oriented. That's even, even less than anthropology. Um, but uh, you know, there is this sense that, that career services is not for us, but also professors don't know. They're professors. That's the job they know. Um, I'm not sure what it's fair to expect of them. Um, and so I know there is um, one dissertation on this topic um, by Amy Goldmacher. The title of it is Something You Love or Something More Practical. And the research fellows read it, and then we got to have her on the conference call one time. It was really cool. She's a business anthropologist. She lives in Detroit, and she does a lot of like um, ethnographically based product development and like website development uh, with like user testing. Um, but she did this, so her dissertation was on working with undergraduates to think about um, what do they see as being their, their future options and how does it interface with what they hear from career services. And the, her sort of top line finding was um, her participants saw a choice that you could either 
go to graduate school, get a PhD, and become an academic, or stop doing anthropology. Which, again, talk about iconicity and erasure, right? How many ways are there of doing anthropology other than being a professor of anthropology in an anthropology department? Like most of them. Um, but if the only role model that you have is your professors, then those are the only anthropologists that you know. And you don't, it's sort of not an askable question whether there's another way of being an anthropologist. Um, so I don't, to the extent that they are, I mean, I guess at, at St. Mary's College, you know, we're hearing that archaeology students specifically do have an idea of, you know, I could get my master's degree and then go do cultural resource management. And that is a more or less well-defined career. Um, you know, I could, I could see my name on the registry of professional archaeologists and I know what that looks like. Um, which I think is a blessing and a curse because there's also a lot of other things that you could do with archaeology. Um, but that one being so high profile makes archaeology feel more career oriented. And I don't know, it's, it's hard to get um, empirical indications of how often people actually go there with a background in archaeology. A lot of times you don't know what somebody's subfield specialization was. It just it gets recorded as a degree in anthropology. So uh, it's hard to say sort of across those sort of macro level trends. Um, but aside from that, yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know where they're going. I don't know if it really is this sort of bounded chronotope and they just don't ask the question because that happens later and I'll worry about it then. You mentioned one student said um, about they had no skills. Yes. So what do you think about how the, like, the higher education could help the students to better define the skills or help them to cultivate new skills that needed for a job um, after graduation or some transferable skills that we, we haven't um, well defined for those students? The presentation was really interesting to me because I did my undergrad in anthropology, cultural anthropology, and I'm doing my PhD now in human ecology, which are both very non-job jobish fields. And we actually have, as like one of the required courses that we have, we have a professional development seminar, where I feel like basically all that we're doing is to learn about speaking about the skills that we're acquiring through this PhD, because I feel like people had saw that same problem. So we have a whole seminar to learn about like what are the transferable skills that we are getting through this debate, what does human ecology mean, and what is the background, um, which is really helpful, but I find it really interesting too that something like that came up. I'm seeing that also at the undergraduate level, it's a sort of a growing trend in anthropology departments to have a, I think the term is a career launcher course, um, like a pro seminar, where you have students come together at a certain point in their academic program and it's interesting to see some programs will put it at the end and some programs will put it at the beginning to say here's what you will learn and here's how to think of it as being preparation for other stuff. Um, to try to more explicitly make those connections like you're saying. Um, one thing, and part of it is like anthropologists are going to be anthropologists and if you, if you start talking about skills, they'll make that move where they start anthropologying you and they'll be like, this is the hegemony of the neoliberal approach to higher education as workforce development and well, you know, we're like, okay, it is, but also my landlord doesn't accept theory as rent, so what am I gonna do? <laughs> like we live in this world, right? Um, if you like, we can say, uh, Mark said we make history, but not in the circumstances of our choosing. Um, so it is important to have that conversation, but I think it's also important to not reduce it to that conversation. Like you can keep both of those thoughts in your head at once. Um, that's why I, I like the word perspectives, which I put in the title of this talk. And it's something that came up yesterday talking with the undergraduate students, um, where somebody said, you know, if I get a um, career in a practice setting, there might be ethical compromises that I have to make to do that work. How, how can that be handled? Um, and really what that made me think of was anthropology gives you the tools to have that conversation when you're presented with that circumstance. Um, you have that ethical awareness. You have the ability to talk about like, who are the people that we're getting this data from and what's an ethical use of it. And if it feels to me like we're not doing that, how do I handle it? And how do I know what I'm comfortable with? Um, 
I don't know if I'd call that a skill. Um, but I think it's something that workplaces in every sector should be asking themselves more. Um, but yes, also, I think it's good to be able to talk about things like, um, I gave an, an example yesterday of uh, a woman named Sally Mengel, who uh, has her BA in anthropology and opened an artisanal ice cream shop in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I read a profile of her in ArkansasOnline.com where she talks about the ways that she's selected flavors that have some aspect of local color in them. And she doesn't say that, but to me that looks like an ethnographic perspective. You know, I know my community. I know how to think about what's appealing to them in this kind of you know, luxury product. Um, and I can apply those findings to make my small business run. And that's a skill. It's a perspective and it's also a skill. And I think the question is how do you encourage students to make that leap to say, you know, what you've learned by reading whoever pick your favorite theorist, you can also apply for that. Um, and I think it's also important to ask who is the right person to, to have that message. Because like we said, it may not be fair to expect it of faculty. So nobody has one mentor. Uh, I think it takes, it takes a lot of voices. If you're an undergraduate student in anthropology and you're thinking, what am I going to do after this? You go on a job board site, you search ethnography or anthropology, and you're only getting requirements that might have a PhD. It's just, because for me, when I finished undergrad, my options were do a PhD or do something else. And it doesn't feel like if you're just looking out there for something, you're not seeing undergrad degrees in anthropology being found on descriptions of what people are looking for. So I don't know if one of those things is lowering the amount of years it takes to get a PhD in anthropology or offering more masters or getting more out into different businesses awareness of anthropology use as a BA. I don't really know what that looks like, but I think um, for me, it's something that I've struggled with a lot. I just got my master's in anthropology, and that's like a midway step, but what step is that really? Um, so it's just a lot of and old thoughts. I don't know. A master's in anthropology can be a midway step, but also there's two masters granted for every PhD. And it's not like the other 50% of them are all grad students that never, you know, they're just sort of taking courses forever. You know, people have masters in anthropology and rewarding professional careers doing anthropology. Um, we have on, the, on this website, if you click through, um, a survey of anthropology masters that was done 10 years ago where people, um, there was an extensive open-ended section to it because anthropologists, um, and so people are talking sort of about what they have done with their masters in anthropology. It's, it's 10 years old and it's currently being replicated. So watch this space. Um, as far as do you, I guess the idea that you need to get a graduate degree to have a professional career uh, raises a question that also came up on the call with the research fellows one time, which is what's a bachelor's degree for? Um, which is something that there's not a lot of really consensus about. Um, it was an interesting conversation that didn't really lead anywhere definitive. Um, but I was reminded of it when I was reading a thing online in the Chronicle or somewhere um, that was written by, I might be misremembering this, but I think it was Lisa Monroe, who um, is a, one of the two principals of the firm Beyond the Professoriate. So they do career advising for PhDs leaving academia. Um, and she wrote this piece basically saying, there's all of this talk about career diversity for PhDs um, and trying to get doc students to think about all of the different jobs that their degree prepares them for. And she says, that's a lie. It prepares you to be a professor. We should stop deluding ourselves. It's not that it's not useful for other things. And to the extent that people use it for other things, that's to their credit. It's not anything that their program is doing for them. Which I have some quibbles with that. I don't entirely endorse it. It was a really interesting idea. And coming off that other conversation with these research fellows, what it made me think of was, okay, 
a PhD in, in anthropology does not prepare you for diverse careers. A BA in anthropology doesn't prepare you for any careers. But it gives you, you know, tools for problem solving and tools for understanding, or skills if you want to call them skills. Um, that everyone who gets their bachelor's in anthropology and goes on to not become a professor of anthropology down the road finds some other use for them, more or less on their own, more or less. And I think the question of career diversity at the graduate level, I think there's a lot we could learn from how that conversation happens at the undergrad level. And so I'm thinking about what are the findings of this that can be sort of fed up the ladder um, to help people at the MA and PhD level think about what can I do with this training? It gets more and more focused as you go because you get more and more focused. Um, but I guess, you know, for myself, I can talk about, you know, my, my spouse is a first generation college student and I was trying to explain to my in-laws what PhD school even was. And the best way that I found to talk about it was, um, if you want to be a doctor, you go to med school. If you want to go to be a lawyer, you go to law school. If you want to be a researcher, you go to PhD school. So I, I can do research design, and I have a sense of certain methods for learning things. Um, and that's kind of the best way that I could think of for, for, for summing it up in 20 words or less. Um, but there's also people with PhDs that don't do research. Um, one way that I've thought about it is that for, for me to have a job like mine, if you buy into what um, Lisa Monroe is saying, assuming this is her and I don't want to be putting words in her mouth. Um, maybe what I am is more like a banker with a JD, where the training that I have is useful for this, but not designed for this. And where your point of intervention might be then is also a complicated question. Like, should we change academic programs to make them more of preparation for a, a, a broad range of things. At the undergraduate level, I think we absolutely should. At the doctoral level, um, I've seen some really interesting proposals. The um, executive director of the American Historical Association, Jim Grossman, has written some really inspiring things about how might graduate education look if it were truly focused on preparing PhDs for broad range of careers. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a moving target. And so everybody's going to find their own answer.